Hey, um, Dawn, I thought uh, maybe we could uh, start by talking a little bit about um, the impact that uh, that you've felt in, in your team, particularly with the move to remote. March and, and what's happened. Yes, you were breaking up a little bit, but I can I can guess what you were asking me. So I think you were asking me to talk about the shift to remote work um, on the team. Is that correct? Yeah, sorry. I've got uh, obviously uh, internet connection down here in Australia is not 100%. So yeah, go ahead. I'd love to, yeah, but let's have a conversation about what's been happening here at Microsoft. Yeah, so, you know, it, it was very interesting. I think it was May 4th. Um, I should have that, that date kind of imprinted on, on my mind. Obviously, uh, the pandemic had, had started before then, and we were keeping a close eye on what was going around around the globe. Um, but March 4th was a pretty important date for us because it was the day that uh, we were encouraged to start working from home. And the encouragement became stronger as the days kind of went on, where it was, uh, you know, pretty much we were told that, you know, unless there was some real severe reason or, or hardship reason that we needed to be in the office, that we were going to be working from home. And, and almost immediately, uh, the team and I thought, you know, here we go. We, th this is a perfect opportunity to use our kind of data-driven mission to help our employees and leaders and managers understand what everyone was dealing with. Um, you know, that at Microsoft, we obviously have a lot of different ways to listen to our employees. We, uh, we listen to employees through active listening, through passive listening. And so um, immediately uh, through our daily pulse survey, so just to, to explain for people that are not familiar, we have a daily pulse survey. Now, what that means is employees are not pulsed every single day, but we do a random sampling of 2,500 employees every business day. And we send out a small survey, it takes about five to seven minutes to complete. And by sending out 2,500 random sampling uh, of, a, of this kind of this random sampling approach to employees, we get a pretty good signal as to what's going on within the organization every single business day, which is pretty amazing. Um, particularly if we look at survey results every week, we get a very good signal. Um, and so what we did was we immediately, we, we, we now we've, we've coined it, um, it's, uh, we were in the response phase in that initial period. Um, we are now in the, in the recovery phase and hopefully soon to be reimagined phase. But in that response phase, the first uh, first thing that we did was add in a couple questions, specifically asking employees and managers, are you getting what you need from management? Like, are, are you getting the guidance that you need? Um, and so we were, we were able to provide that, that feedback to our leadership team pretty much straight away. Okay, and refine our communications to the employee population, to the manager population specifically, and what we could do to ensure that people had the resources that they need um, while we were going through this pandemic. Um, you know, after that, after a few weeks where we started to see the sentiment rise and we were comfortable with what we were getting, um, we shifted to the what we're in today, the recovery phase. Okay, and the recovery phase, we switched the questions um, in our employee listening system to be um, four questions, one having to do with um, your perception of productivity, one, uh, your perception of work-life balance during this time, another one about if you're able to stay connected to your team, and then lastly, whether or not you're, uh, you're getting the support you need from your manager on prioritization. Um, and what was unique to what we were doing is at the same time, and you work in, in our product team, Workplace Analytics, uh, which is not only a tool that we use inside of Microsoft, but it's a tool that many of our customers use. And, and I, you know, I'd love for you in a little bit to share what you're hearing from employees or sorry, from customers. But um, 
what we had was this unique opportunity where we would look at the data through workplace analytics and see that largely everyone was productive. Okay, we, we weren't missing a beat. People were online, people were working. Um, but when you start to add in the sentiment data and you combine the sentiment with this passive kind of ambient listening system through calendar, email, teams, instant messaging, all that kind of stuff, you start to understand the toll that it takes on employees. Okay, and you start to see the impact that it has on their perception of work-life balance. And even the difference in perception of productivity compared to what we assume is productive by looking at um, you know, our systems. And so we were able to get a lot of rich insights uh, through the, the survey data and matching it up with this calendar and email um, metadata that we have. And I'll share just a couple insights and then I'd love to, to kind of flip it over to you to understand um, the work that you've been doing with our customers. Um, but one of the, the, the big insights that we had is individual contributors who feel that they receive effective prioritiz prioritization support are one and a half times more productive and three and a half times more positive with regards to their perception of work-life balance than their counterparts that lack that prioritization support. And managers, while they experience the same boost in productivity, as we saw with the individual contributors, they're five times more positive on the work-life balance sentiment. And that's pretty significant to us, you know, and really trying to push this notion of prioritization, that we can't do it all. OK, we, we can't do it all that people are being stretched in so many different ways right now. They're being stretched in their home life. They're being stretched at work. And so that prioritization is so, so critical for people to maintain um, their sense of productivity and their perception of work life balance. Yeah, it's great that you bring up that um, that passive and that active data collection and, and the combination. I mean, on social media, I talk about fact, not feel. So talking about combining those two together, um, or sorry, fact and feel, combining those two together and not just relying on one, but really um, understanding what is actually happening. And I suppose I'll, I'll, um, I'll kind of add to, to a bit of the understanding for the audience, for those of you who don't um, who don't know, obviously, we've just heard from, from Glint, um, from an employee uh, engagement survey provider. Um, but with Plus Analytics, basically, we're looking at that um, that digital footprint that people leave behind. So as, as you go about your every day, um, we're actually using all of that data from from uh, or that, that metadata from from the emails, from calendar invitations, from our Teams collaboration, and starting to understand how work actually gets done within the organisation. So starting to to see sort of things like um, you, you talked about um, prioritisation support through managers. So understanding sort of who's meeting one on one and and which which areas of the organisation are uh, meeting one on one with their teams. And actually, an example of this. Um, not just using feeling. Actually, uh, I spoke to our area transformation lead a while ago, Liz Blatchford, down here in Australia, and uh, and she actually mentioned a um, a discussion that she was having uh, with her senior leadership team down here, um, and uh, they were talking about the one-on-one -on -one management time, right? And uh, it was actually quite interesting um, that everybody, all the senior leaders in the room, were like, "Yep, no problem." You know, our department, yep, we've got this. We do this, no problem. And she flicked the slide across and. And actually showed the data that, that came from, um, from workplace analytics that showed the team's one-on-one -on -one time to the manager and, and what was happening. And that was obviously very, not, not significantly different, but different enough that, uh, that the managers all kind of went, oh, okay, yeah, I, I, need to, I need to take that. So, you know, going back to that, combining that active data, what people are feeling with this passive data um, and, and really combining it can, can um, provide some, some really good uh, information and insights. Um, Dawn, going back, I mean, continue on with that conversation. Can you talk about, um, you know, some of the some of the changes that we made internally to you talked about prioritization support with that data? How did you empower the the managers to to make changes and and to and to uh, increase one on one time? 
Yeah. And so obviously this is a, a journey and, and I wouldn't say that, you know, we we're claiming victory and, and we've done this and all of our managers are, um, you know, completely changed over in this, in this new way of working. Um, it, you know, it, it definitely is a journey. So, and the journey started before COVID. Okay. And the journey started uh, about a little over a year ago when we officially launched our new manager expectations. Okay. As a company, it's something that we had been working on for quite a few years. Um, it, you know, at, at Microsoft, we have, uh, you know, a large number of managers. And um, what would happen is you would be an individual contributor and all of a sudden one day your your manager would come to you and say, hey, congratulations, you're going to be a manager. You're going to have people working for you. And the manager would say, great. Um, are there some training classes I can take? And well, it, you know, sure there are. But then the manager had to prioritize that and take the classes and actually learn. And, and really what would happen is you'd see a bunch of ICs that kind of turn into super ICs where they do their manager job on the side of their IC job. Um, and and what we realized after doing uh, research and, and kind of years of, of watching this play out, that that's not really what we want to be known for as a company, okay? And that we really want to set clear uh, man, uh, manager expectations and provide that guidance um, and training and learning opportunities for our managers. And so last summer we announced our, our three, uh, which is model, coach, care. Um, those are our three manager expectations. Um, they, uh, and, and I have to tell you what amazing timing, okay? before COVID hit, okay? Because those manager expectations really played into uh, what we needed from our managers during this pandemic and continue to need um, from our managers through this pandemic. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different behaviors that went into deciding those three expectations. And some of the research that we did was looking at manager one-on-ones. And what's interesting is, well, we did find that um, particularly in, uh, in the onboarding okay, area, when you're onboarding a new employee, how important it is to have that, that initial one-on-one -on -one the first week, but then to continue having those connections. Because, you know, what's really critical mm -hmm. is to make sure that your new employees are building their networks, okay? And having that connection yeah. with the manager allows collaboration and, and meet more people. But um, there are definitely certain professions at Microsoft that manager one-on-one -on -one time is more critical than others. Okay. And, and we were able to do that research and truly understand those different professions. And that's what's so interesting about this data is, you know, I've published, um, you know, we publish through the product uh, team, um, different insights that we get. It isn't a one size fits all. Okay, we can't say flat out, this is the magic formula. And if every company around the globe follows this magic formula, this is the outcome that's going to happen. Okay, we can't because every company is unique, has unique a unique culture and a unique strategy that it's driving. And so having access to the data to do the research and analytics yourself to truly understand within your corporation and the culture that you're trying to drive, what are those behaviors that help us achieve the outcome that we're trying to drive? Um, definitely manager one-on-one -on -one time is an example of that. You know, aside from manager one-on-one -on -one time, another thing that we look looked at was manager connects, okay? It, it connects between a manager and employee. The connect process for us is our performance and development process. Okay, so it's a time for managers and employees to sit down and talk about your commitments over the next, um, the next few months, to talk a look back at, at what you did accomplish. I'm really getting very um, self-reflective on what could you have done differently to have more impact, okay? And, and with a focus of diversity and inclusion, and for managers, a focus on how they're going to uh, model, coach, and care, okay? And, and so all of this is built into our performance and development construct. And, and we're able to do the, the research and analytics as to how important those connects are and the outcomes that having those connects are uh, that, that we're able to drive. And so uh, it, it's just amazing. We, we, we don't consider um, 
you know, workplace analytics, we don't, we don't think of it as a tool. We think of it as a data set and it's a data set that we use Mm -hmm. in all of types of, of projects that we have supporting the HR organization. Um, and so, you know, you were asking about manager one-on-ones and how we were supporting managers during this time. When we did launch the Model Coach Care, our manager expectations, we also, we have a, a team of folks that have been, had been working on that and continue to work on the learning and development opportunities for managers. And we have um, emails that would go out. Kathleen Hogan, our, our chief people officer, would send emails to managers. We would also have the program send emails to managers with kind of tips and tricks um, and, and resources for them throughout the pandemic that they could use. Some of them were training resources. Some of them were just resources that they could leverage, um, meaning like, you know, meetings in a box for your team and how you best collaborate during this time working remotely. Um, so it's just, it's been a, a real, I would say, one HR effort where many people around HR have come together to really focus on the employee and the managers during this time. Yeah. I wanted to take a, a, take a step back. You mentioned um, the importance of onboarding um, and uh, the importance of the one-on-one manager and onboarding and also the network size, which I think is brilliant. I think research has shown that, you know, if you, if you have that continuous one-on-one uh, throughout that that initial period of a of a manager, and also um, that um, that that will help them connect into networks. And obviously, at a place like Microsoft, network is everything. I think it's very over- starting here. Fantastic place, but uh, until you build your networks, I think that's that's critical. How important is data now, uh, particularly in the onboarding? process if we start to think about, I mean, here in Melbourne, uh, we're still in lockdown. Um, We're kind of uh, looking at coming out of lockdown. So we've been, I've been working from home since uh, I think end of February. Um, So how important is data, particularly in say the onboarding process as we reimagine going forward, you know, what that might look like in a hybrid working environment, we're not necessarily going to have um, someone there. Yeah, no, it's super, super critical. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it continues to be an area of focus for us because we continue to hire uh, lots of people at Microsoft. We had um, our entire intern um, experience this summer was all virtual. Okay, and and so here you have these um, these folks, um, their summer break from university um, and they joined us from their homes. Okay. And, and they had a much different experience than they, that they normally, than they normally have by being on campus in Redmond or in other places around the world at other campuses. Um, And so obviously the data that, that we're collecting during this time is critical to understand what is it that we can do to create that sense of, of, kind of collaboration and and facilitate building your network, okay, in this virtual way. And so definitely, uh, it's something that we are continuing to look at and continuing to focus on. Yeah. Um, I I think, you know, another uh, another area of of, um, looking at those networks and onboarding has has particularly been with our with our sellers. And and I've, um, uh, one of the things with workplace analytics is we've been really looking and focusing on the data um, of our sellers in particular and, and um, you know, through, through again, looking at um, how our sellers are connecting. Because, of course, we're a tech but a lot of us are. So I think it's been really important to, to understand or what we've looked at is really understanding the impact that COVID and remote working and, and hybrid working, because we're all in, in a different boat in the same storm right across the globe, um, is the impact on, you know, are our sellers still connecting with our customers? Are our sellers um, getting the support that they need from their managers? And, and actually just like looping it back to the networks, um, you know, one of the things we do look at is is we give our sellers time to establish their networks too. We don't kind of say six months, oh, you've, you know, you haven't achieved anything because for for you know from what we can see is we can see it takes a good twelve months to to establish the networks. Um, 
how can you know what what um, what information um, or what what sort of um, other areas are we exploring around uh, around our sellers more in general and 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 how they're operating, including sort of from the area lead down. Yeah, so um, there is a team that's that's very much focused on looking at that seller experience um, and working with different customers. And so um, I know that they've gotten some really good insights so far as to how they can um, continue to be effective and the different times and, and importance of different uh, relationships with customers and the impact that that has on revenue outcome. And so it, it is an exciting uh, scenario um, that the that the team is working on. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned um, in your yeah. role as work, working with uh, our customers? Yeah, no, I'd love to. I think, um, you know, part of um, going back to, to sort of leaders, I think what, what's been really critical um, with the customers that, that I've been talking with and, and working with and, and including Microsoft as well. So we're not, you know, it's not, um, we're not very much different to everybody else. It's really the next problem. It's been, it's been really critical to, to kind of understand the impact that that's having. And I think that's, it's got, it's, it's not going to be a, uh, Topic actually to um, at the start of, of um, the lockdown really um, wanted to wanted to understand this kind of um, didn't really know how to do that so in, in understanding what workplace analytics data can do and, and look at that that fact-based approach and, and that passive data has really given our customers the ability to to understand you know what's happening, and as you were saying before, you know combining with that uh, that um, the active data in terms of engagement surveys, that feeling, um, and using that data to really make change and impacts across the organisation. And the really great thing is we because um, because we're using Exchange Online data and the information that's there. When, when a customer um, turns on workplace analytics and starts to use the tool, uh, starts to use that and access that data, they actually have 13 months worth of information that they can access. So what we've seen is that pre-COVID and what was happening um, and, and compare that to what's happening now. And actually, one of the, the first things that the, that our um, product team actually set up was um, a, a business continuity dashboard where we started to, where we created a dashboard that, that customers can, can get up and, and running super fast. And in fact, one of, uh, one of our customers down here um, in Australia uh, had a call from their executive saying, you know what? analytics um, immunization perspective I need to understand right now within the next week um, the the impact that this is having um, and within a, a space of I think it was actually eight days in total they were able to to um, put in that uh, or set up the the business continuity dashboard have it up and running have it um, comparing data from pre COVID. So that was really, um, really important to, to understand. Actually, I'd be interested to know how much comparison are you doing um, pre pre COVID and and now and 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 what are you what are you doing with that that data and that information? Yeah, so we definitely are looking at pre COVID and now. In fact, uh, we and not, not that again find this uh, at all, but we had our annual engagement survey. Um, it, it, it was actually live and running just before the pandemic kind of hit the, in, in the U.S. Um, so it, it was, uh, it was, you know, active, um, collecting responses in other countries, okay, while the pandemic was going on. But the way we ask the questions in our annual engagement survey is we ask them um, for you to really think about in the past year. Okay, what you've experienced. And so really the results of our survey, we did a bunch of analysis when we got our annual engagement survey back to make sure that it didn't have any impact of the pandemic in it. Okay, and, and after doing a bunch of, of research, we, we were very comfortable with the idea that people really were answering the question about the whole year and not just what was happening um, that, you know, 
current day. Um, that was really our daily pulse survey was tackling that. And so we got a really good baseline, okay, a really good baseline to compare some of the, the questions that we're asking, particularly around work-life balance. Um, obviously, the, the workplace analytics data, we definitely looked at kind of pre-COVID versus COVID. Um, that's where we saw a lot of the increase in collaboration. Okay, we, you know, if we compared it mm -hmm. even to, um, to, you know, this time last year, you can see that the difference in collaboration. Um, again, you know, that, that's not a surprise, right? Because if people are in the office, we're not recording you going down the hall and talking to someone. Okay, but now all of a sudden everything is online. And so those unscheduled calls that used to be walk down the hall and, and talk to someone are now unscheduled Teams calls. And so we could start to see the impact of those unscheduled calls on people's perception of productivity and balance. And what's interesting is to start to peel the onion on that and look at different roles within the company to truly understand the impact of those unscheduled calls. Okay, and not uh, not surprisingly, for our engineers, they have a much lower threshold in terms of those unscheduled calls than our sales organization, for example. Uh, whereas our sales organization, I think, is is very used to unscheduled calls and and for the most part kind of working a little bit more remotely than our engineers were, were used to working. Um, and so it, it did offer us a lot of insight to be able to provide leaders in terms of, you know, making sure that people have focus time. OK, and um, and making sure that people have that time kind of away from the randomization that you get when everyone is online and you can kind of, you know, you end up reaching out to people whenever you need to. But it, it's in a different mode than you're used to. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, that focus time is. Is that similar to what you heard uh, with a lot of our internal customers with the focus time? Yeah, look, focus time is is something that's um, kind of relatively new. A lot of customers um, come and um, really want to understand sort of that that burnout. That's their critical issue. But as we as we start to look at that collaboration increase, I think um, and and as a side kind of impact to, to the burnout is really understanding, you know, how can we schedule some of this time and really kind of block out um, what's uh, what's been happening. And actually, I think my um, my teams has just uh, gone off. Do not. I'm getting like my analytics and blocking that out. I actually have all my notifications blocked out and, and customers actually start to understand, OK, if I can. If I can have my teams really start to focus um, and, and provide them with that time to be more productive and research shows, right, if we if we block out more that that up to two hour period um, and get into the flow of work, we become more productive. So what we can understand through workplace analytics um, is is how you know how many people where in the organization which roles are really taking to this focus time and and really being able to to kind of understand that and through that you can um, add in sort of as a proxy for productivity you can start to add in uh, other data sets and start to understand you know what is the impact particularly in this room that our customers are going through, we really need time to take, right? We need time to, to figure out how we're going to change our, um, our, our model for, for doing work, um, whether it be, you know, a certain sales process or, or maybe it's a, it's a new app that we've got to create or something like that. But understanding in, in the organisation the amount of focus time somebody has is critical um, as it, and, and and is an influence on, you know, how innovative an organisation can be. So what we have is customers starting to think, you know, ask the questions like, well, we, we state that we're an innovative organisation. 
right? But but how innovative are you? Are your other people that you want to to be in that position? Do they have time to do that, or are they in back to back meetings all day? And I think this kind of loops again back to burnout, right? Um, I know I struggle to disconnect. I think there'd be a lot of people on this call that you could put your hands up uh, and uh, and join that club. And I think. One of the reasons for that is just these back-to-back meetings that that we're having um, all the time. And and if we don't be proactive in in putting in that focus time in our calendar, um, we can start to to see that impact. And and we look at that impact of burnout being um, uh, your work week span and your collaboration hours. And obviously that top right quadrant of of people is where we really need to be concerned about um, and really start to um, to target um, change programs um, specifically in that sort of area or that that group of people who are at high risk. And I think this is where workplace analytics helps come in is is um, adding that um, fact based um, approach, that feeling where you go, okay, through our engagement survey, you know, it's the engineering team that are really well, let's let's look at it do they have you know focus time in their 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 diaries do they have um the ability to to disconnect are they working like long hours and particularly from our managers right if you and i'm sure you're in 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 the same in that same situation where from morning to 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 night you're in back-to-back meetings um and uh and you know struggling to get the admin kind of work done so you then start to see things like um, multitasking within meetings and we start to look at that right and and those people who are at high risk of burnout you know have a high uh, incidence of multitasking as well so there's a lot of different areas we can start to to explore in this particular area and in fact um the last time I talked at Pafau, um, we I spoke of of the the blog um, and the research that we've uh, that our team have produced around or, or released the insights around some of the things we found, um, and uh, we're about to release another blog post soon around the impact that we've seen um, since then, um, and particularly that's. Uh, our case study there is and actually looking at this um uh, we kind of looked at a seven uh seven uh risk group seven risks group and and kind of under uh tried to understand who was out of all of those um out of all of the people who was um most at risk of being digitally absent so those who'd really kind of dropped off in terms of their network size in terms of their collaboration etc because they might feel isolated, right, as opposed to those who have that overload risk, so those, you know, higher multitasking, work week hours, et cetera. And by doing that, we we're really able to, to kind of target a change um, and to those particular people. So we go back to that manage um, coach care um, methodology and we start to look at, you know, how can we um, – give our managers uh, the skills that they need to really um, in those one-on-one sessions is really to be able to support um, and help with the workload. And what we found is actually that model has actually really helped um, settle down uh, um, that digitally absent kind of uh, area. So that was really, really special. I don't know if you had any um, involvement in that particularly or have anything more to, to add to that one, but I um, would love to hear your, your opinion on maybe the more broader spectrum. So we didn't um, actually, we work very closely uh, with, uh, for, for those of you listening, we work very closely with Carly's team. Um, and I actually just reviewed that blog post last week, but it was not something that we worked on um, uh, directly with the team. Um, exactly, it's yeah. kind of, yeah, sometimes sometimes we work directly with the, with the workplace analytics product team and, and other times we don't, particularly if, if we're not including sentiment data or other types of, mm-hmm. uh, it, you know, considered to be more highly sensitive um, types of, of employee data. Um, and, uh, but I did want to make sure that we spent a little bit of time on the future and kind of what we're looking yes, at. Yes, I was going to say, yes. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about just the work that, that my team's doing um, to be able to provide 
HR leaders with additional insights uh, as we go into this reimagine phase. And then I'd love to hear from you as to what you're thinking about in terms of the product and, and how we're continuing to evolve the product. Um, you know, inter internally, again, our vision is to be able to provide HR leaders and probably eventually business leaders with information at their fingertips in terms of different behaviors that lend themselves to different outcomes. Okay, so uh, our, again, creating a dashboard for HR leaders that they can use to understand the impact of attrition on some of these very regular tasks that people do. Like, you know, if people continue to spend time working after hours, okay, how does that impact burnout and, and then lead to attrition? Okay, and we'll be able to provide this type of data for our HR leaders to start monitoring. Um, so that that's something. And again, we're, we're not getting into individuals. Okay, so we're not looking at individual data where it's going to pop mm. up one individual go and do something about this one individual. No, we're looking for broad and aggregate trends, but we know that there are different trends depending on the organization that you're looking at. And so that's why we do think that it's important to be able to look at this by kind of large organizations, specifically differences in the engineering orgs versus the sales orgs. And so how can we pull in just lots of different data sources that we have available to us to start to understand these trends and then and provide that data to our HR leaders at their fingertips so that they can take action on that, or at least provide the, the, their business leaders um, with some, some good guidance that will help them, help them with communications, help them um, provide guidance to managers. And some of that guidance will be company-wide guidance, but some of it will be more nuanced, okay, for the, the particular mm -hmm. organizations that, that they're supporting. And I wanted to add, actually, um, just going back to your uh, your point about attrition, I think this is a one um, one area where we start to um, where we can, you know, the cost of attrition, right? The cost of of somebody disengaging, of somebody's networks decreasing, um, of somebody not being as productive, and and we can with this data we can start seeing that. Um, and then obviously the cost of not having somebody in the position and as we talked about at the start, the cost uh, of, of, of ramping somebody up um, and the productivity time to, to ramp up. I think it's super important. The more we can understand about this, this type of area, the more we can kind of look at uh, that um, cost avoidance around attrition, right? The, I think it's a Gallup survey that talks about I think it's 150 to 250% of somebody's salary, right, in terms of the cost of attrition. So in terms of the investment data and being able to look at that and you know whether it be tools or resources the importance of really bringing this data in um, and and the cost of that really if you think about you know saving four people from from disengaging from um, you know from leaving the organization that probably would cover your cost of, of probably a resource and the tools right so it's super important to to really be looking at that but you did mention um, I think uh, about the future I think um, for the, uh, we're at our customers and all reimagined, so we're reimagining in a whole range of ways. Um, what we're starting to look at within the tool is, is and as you said, bringing, and, and I think I think as the previous speakers were talking about um, uh, around bringing the, the insights directly to our managers and, and to be able to kind of make change. And, and you know, we know that um, the person who's going to make the most change in an employee's uh, life is, is really, or work life is around um, having those insights. And I think part of what we're, um, part of what we're uh, releasing into, into, uh, into workplace analytics, into my analytics, is, is the, the ability to have surface those insights in the flow of work in your team's environment. So being able to see your own your own insights, your own personal insights to make a change. I know I made it, you know, I look at my well, my quiet time and my wellness and kind of go, oh yes, well, I've got to make a change there. Um, but from a manager's perspective, being able to kind of understand, you know, what 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 in, what is impacting my team. And I think the other cool thing that I'm I'm really super excited about, as I mentioned before, I have I struggled to disconnect here uh, working from home is a virtual commute um, and uh, being able to kind of um, 
put in a time in your diary um, that the virtual commute comes up. It starts to to encourage you to do things into this and you can with headspace with headspace is actually you can have that um that commute there and just that that ability to disconnect i i'm super excited and that's that's very soon coming out in the product and i'm i'm i think i'll be one of the ones that will be uh using that significantly have i mean have you struggled with sort of that that disconnect and and how have you gone with uh with that work remote working well, I'm so glad that you brought up the the my analytics and the nudges, and um, because I do think that that's such an important aspect of kind of what we're trying to do, um, empowering employees to look at their own data. Okay, that 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 data mm -hmm. that's not available for HR to look at, you know, by by individual, your manager can't see it, but you have access to understand um, the, the different things that you can change to become more effective and more productive. And definitely, I am with you, I have definitely struggled to disconnect. Um, and I used to have a, a commute that was almost an hour, probably each way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't have that anymore. Uh, and definitely the first month I struggled with leaving this room. I was in this room uh, all the time. I'd go have dinner and I'd come back to this room. And I had to kind of learn um, that, you know, hey, for my own well being, um, one of the things I learned was I actually had to get outside. And even when it was pouring rain out in Seattle, which it often is, I had to get outside and take a walk. And so I had to book walk time for myself. If I could do it in the morning before my meeting started, that was ideal. But then I would try to get out another time during the day, like during lunchtime and, um, or even after my calls were done at the end of the day, that's what I needed to do for my sanity. And I feel like this mm. kind of, uh, virtual time that, that might, that is my virtual commute time. Really. It's my time to think yeah. it's my time to, learn. um, I listen to yeah. probably every one of these podcasts during that time. Um, I, but yeah, I, I have definitely taken it as my, my me time, learning and development time, you know, all kind of wrapped into one. So I'm glad you, you yeah. mentioned my analytics and I continue to be very bullish on the fact that, um, you know, even the work that we're doing, it's like, how do we infuse that into technology so that people are, are nudged in a way that they seamlessly, uh, you know, change their habits and their behaviors to get to the outcome that, that we're looking for. And that's definitely yeah. something that we continue to work on. Yeah. I think, you know, that's, uh, it's a fantastic um, segue into, I think the last thing that uh, I think would be really good to cover and, and, and it's super important um, with, uh, within our community. And that's around sort of that privacy, that governance. So what I'd be really uh, keen to understand in the last couple of minutes um, is really around what have we done from a Microsoft perspective to, um, you know, I, I get these questions all the time from customers like, oh, but it's Big Brother, you know, you're watching, et cetera. What are some of the things in terms of governance, in terms of communication? How do we um, at Microsoft really um, uh, make our employees feel comfortable with what's happening? How do we create that security uh, around that, that data? You know, the, the theme, people data for good, I think it's really to understand, you know, there's a lot that we can do, but should we do it? So what are we doing here at Microsoft? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question and one that I get uh, it probably as often as you do. Uh, fortunately for us at Microsoft, uh, data confidentiality, data privacy, security is uh, it, it is non-negotiable. Okay, it is of the utmost importance, and we kind of learned the hard way. We uh, many years ago we had a, a product launched internally that we did not communicate very well to employees and uh, we learned a lot from it. And when we were ready to start using workplace analytics, we were very deliberate in the communications that we made to all employees to explain to them what this was, that there was a team of folks in the in HR that were uh, analysts and they would have 
um, de-identified access to this type of information for analytics purposes only. We would be looking at aggregated trends and insights that we're going to in turn help employees and managers be more effective, be more productive. And so by, by really sharing that with employees, you start to bring them in. You're being transparent with your employees about what you're doing with the information. Um, even at that time, we had not been cleared with, um, to use this product outside the U.S. This was, you know, years ago. So we were very clear that we were going to focus on the U.S. only at this time. And that as more countries uh, became comfortable with what we were doing, that we would add them over time and be very transparent with the folks in those countries um, about when when we would add their, the data in to the data set. And so we've continued with that uh, to be transparent with our employees where we come back and we share the insights with them. We share the insights through the manager mails that are coming from the, the team in HR and our chief people officer. Uh, my team publishes HBR articles. Your team publishes blog posts. I mean, we're constantly sharing our insights with the employees um, internally about what we're seeing and how how they can learn from what we're doing. And particularly because often the work that we do is combining our survey data with this, um, you know, passive employee listening through workplace analytics is we have a very clear confidentiality statement on our employee surveys about what and what we do with the information. Okay. And obviously our survey data is uh, voluntary. You don't have to um, fill out a survey, okay? And so employees that are not comfortable with that, they don't have to. But our, you know, for our annual engagement survey, our response rate is so high in the upper 80 percentage uh, point, which is a very high for a company the size of Microsoft. And so obviously people are comfortable with what's going on. And, but we need to continue to make sure that we are transparent with our employees so that they continue to be comfortable. Yeah, exactly. And I think it just takes, as you said, it just takes one move in this particular area and then, you know, you can you can lose that sort of um, engagement from, from your employees and, and that trust as well. And, and, you know, Microsoft does run on trust. So, so being open and transparent with the information we're doing and, and sharing that, that data and that information to be able to, to make changes. Um, and I think, you know, the customers that, that I've spoken with have exactly the same, um, exactly the same approach, you know, doing things like, you know, making sure where, where, you know, just because we can, should we do, you know, should we look into that particular thing? Another thing is really being um, prepared with the right use cases to, to, to kind of explore. Don't but you? hey, I, um, I could listen to you to all day. And I see that uh, I think Carly just uh, froze, but hopefully that'll unfreeze in a second, because I do want to say that not only do I appreciate what you all do, because you've echoed several times that you're looking out for the well-being of the employee to give them insights, how they can manage their workload, manage their time so they can be not only better workers, better contributors, but also have a life that is you know, balanced and, and you know, peaceful. So kudos to you, not only what you do, but, but how you do it. Um, as we start to wrap up here, any uh, closing comments uh, from you, Don? I think Carly might be frozen still. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us today. Uh, it was fun for me to get to speak with Carly because even though we work at the same company, uh, what's surprising is we work, you know, across the globe from one another, and we don't get to connect uh, that that often. So that was uh, that was fun. So thank you very much, and hopefully, you know, we were able to share enough about kind of what we're doing internally, but then also a little bit about how we're trying to help our customers as well um, through this pandemic and and really helping people reimagine the the future of work and how we can use technology to make that better. Yeah, and you know, you're I think absolutely I'm, uh, right. and Oh, you're yay, perfect, you're back. I'm, yeah. I'm here. <laughs> of course, it, there's nothing like a presentation on PAFA without me having a technical glitch and my internet dying. <laughs> so thanks, Australian MBN. Sorry hey, to we'll, leave you in the lurch. We're we'll, we'll 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 wrapping up. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, I just want to thank you, Carly, as well. I love the way you show up. And, you know, I was just telling Don, not only what you all do as a firm and individually, but how you do it with a very virtuous ethical position that serves as a model on how to um, to do this work. One thing I do want to ask, and Carly, you can take this, is we had talked throughout the day when people talk about 
organizational network analysis, when I talk about activity or behavioral uh, based analytics, um, which arguably workplace analytics can be bucketed into, it's like, oh gosh, how am I going to do that? And so mm. the contention is that we in our discipline have to be educated shoppers and know who is a trustworthy, effective partner, as opposed to being a great analyst and who's actually going to go crunch all this data. Because the more I hear about workplace analytics, the more I use it, because we use Teams and Office 365 within our firm. Thank you, Don, for <laughs> nudging us that way. Um, it, it, it's massively valuable. So, what, Carly, what's your contention on that, that we have to be educated shoppers as well as good analysts? Yeah, I think what's happening at the moment is you're starting to see a transition, particularly within uh, within the workplace analytics product. We're starting to see some of that more um, deeper organisational network analysis being surfaced in sort of regular tools. So it's no, it's not necessarily uh, a requirement that you need a data scientist or need to be a data scientist to to do all that uh, that sort of information. I think it's it's very important as you as you go out there and looking uh, at particular products. And, and looking at how you can access this information is really going back to that security perspective because what you're looking at is you're really looking at some really um, deep, really interesting data. And, and obviously through workplace analytics where you start to you start to be able to, like within the Microsoft um, compliance boundary framework, you can start to kind of pull together all the information in terms of how often Dawn and I are connecting. Is it just one way or is it both ways? How strong is that relationship? So under Understanding, you know, um, what you need, what your use case is. I think I, as I uh, as I left the conversation, use cases, but really understand what your use case is, understand the security, uh, and then once that you can start to kind of and understand your resources as well. And once you've got that, you can start to kind of go out there and investigate in terms of the tool sets there. But the security is, I, I think, the, the biggest thing for me is, is really, you know, this, this data is, is quite critical and, and confidential to an organisation. So I think um, knowing you've got a trusted partner there to, to work with you um, in this particular area and, and you know, from a, a workplace analytics perspective, as I said, you can go down deep and you can be a data scientist and really go to town in that particular area and we've got a lot of customers who are doing that. But what we're seeing within the, the out-of-the-box dashboards is we're starting to see a lot of that network kind of analysis that um, that is coming in in terms of you don't need to be a data scientist to be able to kind of understand, you know, your new hires and, and what their network looks like to, to start with and how it's building. If you can use it, you can see it in the dashboard boards there. Well, again, I can't thank you two enough. Actually, I will do. I'm going to thank you with some people data for good socks. So you'll get those. Um, <laughs> Carly, it might take you like three months to get there. And but I, I also have to That's just, okay. I'll wait. Just, to, just to make you know, bring a smile. <laughs> to Dawn. She gave me the sticker uh, last year. So hey, uh, again, thank yeah, you well, both for sharing. <laughs> Oh, look at that. There we go. There we go. <laughs> but I'm missing out. I need I need to be sent a sticker as well. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so show and tell. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put it in the mail with the socks. All right. Well, again, hey, thanks to you both. You all be well and look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully before too long. But yeah, thank you. Really, really appreciate you both. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dawn. Thanks, Al.